The scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 9. Uh, first, we'll be reading verses 1 to 14, and then 24 to 41. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, No, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, Yes, I am the same one. They asked, Who healed you? What happened? He told them, The man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now? they asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees, because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this, because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind and now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed. I told you once, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why? That's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshipped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. 
Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, Are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Well, today we continue our series of encounters with Jesus from this uh, rather long story, which even though we cut some out, is, is still quite long. It's, it's hard to uh, tell any of it without telling all of it. Uh, last Sunday, we looked at the familiar story of Jesus's encounter with the woman at the well. When she went to get her water that day, she had no idea that she would meet the Messiah. And following their conversation, she returned to her village and she shared about Jesus, about the man that she'd met and said, could this be the Messiah? And through her, many people came to believe. Through this unlikely messenger, uh, people heard the good news and came to Jesus. This chance encounter changed her life and it changed the lives of many people. And one of the, the stories that we learn from this, or one of the, the lessons is that, uh, as, as Paul told us last week, that God can use unlikely people, that God can use us, even those of us who, who don't think that we have much to offer. Uh, God can use us. And we see a story of, of just that simple message, and, and people respond. Today, however, we, we look at a, a different story, uh, a much different encounter with Jesus from the Gospel of John. The disciples observe a man born blind from birth, and they ask Jesus whether his blindness is the result of his sin or his parents' sin. And their assumption is one widely held that such a disability must be the direct consequence of sin. I mean, someone's to blame for this, otherwise he wouldn't be blind. Uh, but Jesus rejects this assumption and he turns his, their attention uh, away from the cause, why, and to the purpose, uh, what God will do. This blindness presents God the opportunity to restore and heal. And the point is not so much that this man was born blind for just this moment, but, but rather even more than that, that everything that we are is for the glory of God. Uh, even our blindness is for God's glory. The darkness of his eyes does allow for the light of the world to shine in him. And it's interesting, too, that this blind man doesn't go looking for an encounter with Jesus. In fact, as we read the story, they never speak. There, there's no sense that they even interacted uh, before Jesus goes up and spits on the ground and, like, makes some mud and, like, puts it on the guy's eyes. Uh, I mean, you could imagine if someone did that to you that uh, you might not feel so great about it. That, that would be the sort of thing to, uh, you know, to resist. Uh, Jesus just shows up unannounced and does this. And then the only words he speaks to the man are, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. That's all he says to the man. And apparently the man says nothing to him, at least that we know. There's, there's no interaction. It, this just happens. And so the man goes off to this special pool and he washes and then he sees. But by the time he sees, Jesus is, is disappeared. Uh, the, the action sort of happens off stage, as it were. We don't, we don't see it. Jesus is not with him when he receives his sight. And this man's healing sparks a controversy. We, we read the part where, where some people recognize him, and they're like, yes, that's, that's definitely the same guy that we know was born blind. And other people are saying, no, that can't possibly be him. He, he probably just looks like him. You know, a lot of people look the same, dress the same. It's, it's, it's not the same person. Um, I mean, imagine there was a person on your street that you sort of know, you've seen him many times, and then uh, you know that they're blind, and then uh, all of a sudden you, you hear that they can see. I mean, what, what do you think? You think, well... I must be mistaken somehow. I must be getting confused. Uh, the, these can't be the same people because blind people don't see. 
should probably have a little sympathy with these doubters, you know, the ones that think, oh, this couldn't be true, because it's hard to believe. Uh, our minds are not always well equipped uh, to handle miracles. Uh, and we tend to go looking for some other explanation. That's how we work. It's like, well, no, it, it can't be like that. Um, but the man insists that he really is the same person. And so they asked him how he received his sight. And he tells them about what the man called Jesus, or the man they called Jesus. He, do, he doesn't even know that his name is Jesus. <laughs> He's just like, well, people call him Jesus. Uh, he, he came up and did this. Uh, he doesn't really even know who Jesus is. Uh, and yet Jesus opened his eyes. And these curious people ask the man, well, then where can we find this Jesus? Where, where is he? And the man can just say, I don't know. Uh, it seems like the people want to find Jesus, and they, they ask this man whose eyes have been opened, and, and he, he can't really help. Um, he cannot lead them. So, eager to solve the mystery of this man who it seems is blind but now can see, the people uh, brought the man to the authorities. This is what we do when we can't solve a problem, right? We, we go to like the next level. Uh, we go to the police or the government, like, well, let's, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's figure it out. And of course, complicating matters here is that he was healed on the Sabbath. Uh, some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was deep division of opinion among them. The Pharisees are trying to come to grips with the evidence in front of them. They're trying to make sense of what they think they know with what they see, what sure seems to be true. On the one hand, they assume that work on the Sabbath is against God's will. And yet it seems something has happened on the Sabbath that only God could do. It's always easy to mock the Pharisees. It feels good to make fun of them sometimes. Oh, those dumb Pharisees. Uh, but again, a little sympathy might be in order. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're thinking this is the way things work and all of a sudden, you know, something totally contrary to that, it's like, well, how do you make sense of that? Um, it's not easy for any of us to be confronted with the possibility that things that we really thought were true are not true. Uh, and probably none of us are as good at assimilating uh, new information and experience as we think we are. We all think, well, if, if the truth is there, then I will just accept it. Most of us don't work that way. Uh, it takes a little time for us to really accept what is true, and oftentimes we also resist it. Um, it's unsettling to have your, your paradigm shifted. Uh, it just sort of takes the ground out from underneath of you. Uh, and this is especially true if your identity and your power and your, uh, your whole person, your whole self-understanding depends on these other things being true. Uh, if it depends on this old paradigm, it's very hard when things get shifted and you say, who am I? Uh, uh, the things I thought were true or not. If you're a lawyer, like, like the Pharisees, uh, you need the law. If it turns out the law isn't true anymore, then, well, then who am I? What am I? Everything I, I based my life in is, is suddenly uh, like sinking sand. So they, you can see how you want to hold on. You want it, the old things to be true. And we learn from the Pharisees that those who have power in this world, that, that those who are like in the good place, uh, they don't want things to change, right? The Pharisees are on top, at least in the Jewish world, that they're, they're at the very top of society. And so they don't want this guy, Jesus, coming along and disrupting everything. I mean, they're, they're where they want to be. Um, the established order suits them well. Uh, so they're quite literally not interested and Jesus establishing a new order. 
And this can easily be true of anyone who by the world's standards has power and prestige. Uh, This is why Jesus tells us it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven uh, because the rich among us tend to like the kingdom of this world. So these Pharisees, unable to resolve the paradox in front of them, uh, they attempt to fall back again on the possibility that the evidence is invalid. Uh, they, they convince themselves, no, he, he wasn't actually blind. Uh, so they summon his parents to testify. This is the part of the story in the 10 verses we didn't read. So they ask the parents, uh, is, is this, uh, you know, what happened to your son here? And they're very fearful, the parents. They say, uh, well, well, we know he, he's our son, and we know he was born blind, but beyond that, uh, we have nothing to say. Uh, they, they don't, they don't want to get involved. Uh, they're not rejoicing because their son can see. Like, this is sort of unsettling for them, too. Uh, this presents a problem uh, because, uh, well, we, we just we want to stay out of it. Um, that's all they can say. So the Pharisees then call the man again. Like, they, they still don't have an answer that satisfies. They, they still don't feel comfortable with the situation. Uh, and this is where we, we picked up uh, in verse uh, 24. Uh, they again call him, and this time they're a little more hostile towards him. They're not so much in, like, the uh, fact-gathering mode as they are in the we're going to break you down mode. Uh, they seem to hold him responsible for having received his sight on the Sabbath. And they're like angry with him for that this happened. Um, and since Jesus is st- still nowhere to be found, I mean, it's really interesting, Jesus is there in the beginning and he's there at the end, but throughout this, this whole other uh, part of the chapter, it's just the Pharisees and, and this man. And since Jesus isn't there to criticize well, they're, they're taking their, their wrath out on this person. Uh, and the Pharisees have decided that they're just going to deny the evidence. We sure seems that this man was born blind. That can't possibly be true. We need to preserve things like they are. Uh, so this man must be a sinner. We know that you can't heal on the Sabbath. That can't be possible. And they ask the man, so, so what happened? What do you think? And he gives the perfect response. He says, like, I don't know if he's a sinner. You guys can answer that. But what I do know is that I was blind and now I can see. And that's a pretty significant fact in that man's life. I mean, you can question a lot of things, uh, but it's hard to question that you were blind and now you can see. He says no more and no less than the truth. He doesn't know much about Jesus. There's a lot of things he can't say, uh, but he does know that his eyes have been opened. And very interestingly, the, the initial chapter that, or the initial question that began this chapter was, is this man blind because of, of sin? And now the Pharisees are, are telling this formerly blind man that his sight is the result of sin. And that guy can't win either way. It's like, well, he's blind because of sin, and now, now, there's, now he can see, and like, well, that's sin too. It's like, I mean, what do you, what do you want? Um, and instead, he teaches the teachers. He says, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Seems like he's got reason on his side, right? Um, but the authorities become indignant, because this man refuses to deny his own experience. I mean, he, they, what are they asking for him? You know, oh, we need you to, to deny this. Like, to deny that you were blind and now you can see. Um, and they throw him out. And just, they, just want to, they just want to get rid of it, right? Because it, it contradicts everything that they think is true. They're holding on to an old way of thinking. So again, last Sunday... We see an encounter with Jesus that led, that led many people to believe. Unexpected people. But this is a story not of acceptance, but of rejection. And not just of Jesus, 
but of the people who encounter him. I mean, meeting Jesus, he, the, the man did get his eyes open, which is undeniably good, but, but from there, it's pretty rough. Uh, I mean, his encounter with Jesus led to a lot of hostility from others. And as much as we should believe, uh, and, and, and we do believe, that an encounter with Jesus can lead unexpected people uh, to come to faith, that can happen. That's the, that's the lesson, one of the lessons of, of John 4. Uh, I expect that this story of the blind man might resonate a little bit more with our situation Imagine how you might be received if you shared with a colleague uh, that I've encountered Jesus. I, I've encountered him. I, I once was blind, but now I can see. We just sang that, right? You, you sang it. Is it true? Well, what if you told someone that was true? I was blind, and now I can see. That's a message that many people lack ears to hear. Of course, these 2,000 years later, people reject Jesus not because we're introducing a new paradigm. Uh, they, don't, they don't push back because we're, we're introducing something new, right? They think we're like clinging to an obsolete paradigm. Uh, we're, we're doing like the old things, and we all know better than that now. The authorities in our world uh, have also decided that these things can't possibly be true. All this Jesus stuff, I mean, aren't, aren't we past that, right? Uh, we've, we know better now. Um, uh, the one who proclaims what Jesus has done uh, is, is sort of pushed aside, is marginalized or, or persecuted. You know. Again, if, if you showed up in, uh, in, in your work or, or any number of places and started talking about what Jesus has done, well, you know, people, they get a little embarrassed for you. Um, in so many ways, this blind man is every Christian. And that's really the point, that his experience is the experience of believers. And then he has a second encounter with Jesus at the end of the chapter. We read, When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. And again, we, we've been given lots of people's sympathy in this passage. Maybe this guy deserves a little sympathy too. He's had a rough day. Uh, you, you would think the, the answer is obvious. You know, Jesus has healed the eyes, his eyes, and he says, you know, do you know who the, do you believe in the Son of Man? He's like, oh, yeah, who, where is he? You know, it's like, Jesus says, well, it's the one speaking to you. I am he. And the man declares, Lord, I believe, then worships Jesus, which is, in fact, the most sensible response. And then Jesus provides the, summation of really the whole chapter. I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those that think they see that they are blind. And the irony here is very heavy. The blind man is the one who can see, but the Pharisees who think they can see are the blind. The ones who are supposed to get it don't, and the ones who aren't supposed to get it, like the Samaritan woman and this blind man, do get it. And the point, however, is not just that the blind can see on their own, but rather that the blind know that they're blind, and therefore they know they need help seeing. When the woman at the well and the blind man encounter Jesus, they don't immediately see him for who he is. But they're receptive. They're willing to be shown. They are open to the revelation. 
they encounter him from a position of humility, not of authority. And this really makes all the difference. I don't need to tell you that we live in a world in which many people claim to see who sure seem to be stumbling around in the darkness. You know, I mean, the people that, that think they know best and have rejected all the things that, that we think are, are true and important, uh, you know, at least from our perspective, often seem to be walking around in darkness. And in fact, uh, in our world, it is often the Christians who are considered the blind ones, right? We're, we're the ones that haven't opened our eyes to see the light. You know. um, it all gets flipped around. This is what we do. Uh, we don't live in an age which is especially receptive to Jesus. Though, I always like to say, you know, we shouldn't fall into the temptation of thinking that we live in the worst age ever. We, we like to do that. Oh, it's never been worse than it is now. People have always rejected Jesus. And that's what this chapter is about. I mean, even in his own day, they rejected him. This isn't exactly a new thing. Uh, rare is the time that is characterized by the sort of humility necessary to accept Jesus, uh, to acknowledge that we are all blind and that we need help to see. And maybe in our weaker moments, uh, we might take pleasure in the thought that, uh, that what Jesus uh, says will, will come and uh, that the so-called seers among us, those that think they can see, they'll be shown just how wrong they are. And won't we enjoy that? We might even conclude that if humility is necessary to receive the gospel, then some people just need to be humiliated. You know, like, I'll, I'll help you out. I'll, I'll, I'll put you in your place so that you, know, you can then hear the good news. Um, rarely, if ever, is that our role. The danger for us uh, is that, again, we, we turn the tables and we claim that we can see while everyone else is blind. Uh, this passage is sort of working both ways because it's easy for us to say, oh, w you know, we're, we're not the people he's talking about. We're not the ones who claim to see. But we easily can become those people. Of course, in one sense, we do believe this. We do believe we're the ones that can see. And of course, that's true. But we only see because our eyes have been opened. And this is not our own doing. This is a gift. I mean, you don't see because uh, you're a great person. Or you were, you're just superior to others. I mean, you see because your eyes have been opened to see. Um, and the most any of us can possibly claim is that we were humble enough to let it happen. And even that humility is itself a gift. And if it's humility that allows us to see in the first place, and I really think that is the, the driving point of this chapter, that it's the humble that can see Jesus, it's the prideful who cannot. If it is humility that allows us to see in the first place, it's only our continued humility that prevents us from becoming blind. Uh, if you say, well, I can see now, and then return uh, and be prideful in that, well, then the blindness sets in again. And if we do really want the blind to see, and we should, uh, if we want the blind to see, we should, in our own humility, uh, point them to Jesus, point people in the direction of Christ uh, who humbled himself, uh, even to death on a cross. Uh, that's humility. And that's where we're headed in just a few weeks. Let us pray. Lord, you came to us as one who was humble. 
Teach us humility. Uh, Teach us to see that we are blind, that in fact we can't see, and that we need you to open our eyes. Lord, help us not to be prideful. Help us not to think that we have all the answers. Help us not to lean on our own understanding, but to acknowledge that we need you. Lord, give us the gift of the humility to receive you. And we pray that, that others will come to see you too. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.